Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, Mr. Srinivas and Professor Srinivas, um, it's really an enormous honor for me to be invited to give the Srinivasan Memorial Lecture. Um, I'm told by Krish that uh, one of the lectures actu lecturers ac actually collapsed on stage, and so I'm going to do my very best to keep upright, and I hope I am going to cover this difficult topic, the question of the heredity of epilepsy, and I hope I, I'm going to speak for about an hour, and I hope I don't bore you too much with this topic. Um, I never met Mr. Srinivasan, but I have grown to know about him from the many dedications and articles uh, which I have read. And I'd like to begin, therefore, first by paying tribute to Mr. T.S. Srinivasan and also to his extended Srinivasan family. T.S. Srinivasan had a career of brilliance and innovation. Um, and as uh, Dr. Krishnamurthy told me, his achievements were also the embodiment of compassion. Um, his was a life devoted to, the, to advancement and improvement in industry and also in public service, and not least to neuroscience. Um, I learned a great deal about the generosity of, the, of Mr. Srinivasan and his family in the field of neurology, and their support of a number of ventures and developments at the VHS in Chennai. I've over the past 40 years visited India on quite a few occasions and in the last 15 years have been a sort of regular visitor to VHS um, as a guest of Professor Shinavas and, and also his son. And it's extraordinarily gratifying to see the flourishing state of neurological care um, at the hospital <coughs> and the clinical work matching as I think it now does uh, the best in the world. I was also very impressed on this current visit to, to see the newly opened Center for Advanced Rehabilitation Specialties, which was sponsored by TVS Motors, um, and uh, which is a important step, I believe. I feel humbled by the qualities and example of Mr. T.S. Srinivana and his family, uh, but we should celebrate the achievements the family have brought to neurology through their consistent munificence and support. Um, in this lecture, I thought I would attempt um, these tasks. Um, in the first part of my talk, I'm going to give an historical overview of the major theories of heredity, um, starting in the year 1860, which was when modern scientific thought uh, in neurology really began, and over the next uh, 100 years. Um, and in the second part of my talk, uh, talk about the last 50 years, uh, which were the, what one might call the molecular era, in which there have been phenomenal advances in the science of heredity. Um, in the third part of my talk, um, I will talk about the current state, both the successes and the failures, and briefly in the last part, talk about uh, what might be future directions uh, and the ways in which epilepsy genetic studies may develop in the future. And although in general this is going to be a celebration of the extraordinary advances in genetics, I will emphasize that many of these concepts derive from social fashion and social theory as much as from science. And furthermore, some of the theories proved erroneous or are erroneous and in their turn had major social implications. And I'm going to emphasize both the good and the bad um, aspects of these social implications. The basic message is science really is never neutral, least of, least of, least of all genetic science. And I hope you'll see that having a historical view uh, is important because there are lessons from history that we should not forget. Now, this is a potentially very large topic, and furthermore, in parts, it's quite technical. And what I'm going to do is try and take a, as broad a brush approach as possible, but it's not going to be comprehensive. It's not going to be sufficiently explained. And for these inevitable failings, I wish to apologize in advance. 
So let's start first with the historical overview. Now, for over 2,000 years, ever since the writing of Hippocrates, people have realized that epilepsy was an inherited disease. But it was really only around 1860 that the modern scientific method began to be used and the modern discussion of this topic uh, was initiated. And I think it's important to remember that this was an era when there was no investigatory facilities at all. There were no scans, there was no EG, and doctors only had the clinical history and the clinical material uh, on which to make a diagnosis. It was indeed a time when even neurology had only just begun to exist as a specialty and when there was no classification of neurological disease whatsoever. There was also at this time no idea how heredity worked. Although it, really, it was recognized that somehow epilepsy was inherited, uh, how this happened was completely unknown. Darwin's Origin of the Species had been published only the year before, and Mendel, uh, Mendel who devised his laws, uh, devised these 10 years later. The word genetic and gene were not conceived. And yet, despite this, there were some very interesting concepts of heredity uh, in neurological disease formed at these times, which still have resonance today. Now, the contemporary picture in relation to epilepsy um, can be gained from three books published uh, in 1860, 1861, and 1888. And in these books, there are four concepts which I'd like to expand upon. Um, the first was that the universal belief that epilepsy was always due to an interaction between inheritance, inher inherited factors, and other causes, outside factors, sometimes things like brain tumors or strokes, but sometimes environmental factors. But these factors always uh, interacted with inherited factors. Um, and they divided these causes into two, what they called the predisposing causes, which was inheritance, and the exciting causes, which were these other factors. Um, and Steve King, who has always wrote in a very flowery and um, imaginative way, thought of it like gunpowder and a match. The gunpowder was the inheritance. The drier the gunpowder, the more likely it was to explode. And um, the smaller the, and the drier it was, the smaller was needed to be the exciting factor. Um, and this idea that there is a mixture of factors is still very important today, and we'll discuss that a bit later. Um, Russell Reynolds considered hereditary to be the major influence in 30% of his cases, and Gowers, William Gowers, of course, who was uh, the renowned English neurologist, thought hereditary was the overwhelming cause in over 60% of his cases. The greatest neurologist of the time, of course, was John Hewlings Jackson. Um, and he had some very interesting ideas on causation. He accepted that there were predisposing and exciting causes. Um, <clears throat> and he also accepted that the predisposing cause was inherited. And his great contribution was to recognize that the inherited, that the inherited mechanism was hyperexcitability of the cortex. This was an amazing insight, really, at a time when there was no chemistry and there was no physiology. And he realized that the hyperincitability was, in fact, in his view, inherited. He, interestingly, had no interest in other causes and thought the cause of epilepsy was the mechanism of epilepsy. And that's an, a very important concept, which, again, I think only recently people are, again, focusing upon. He thought that all seizures, whatever their cause, had this final common pathway, which was overexcitability of nervous tissue, in his view, uh, due to deranged nutrition. Um, but this overexcitability was the cause, whatever was the more downstream uh, influence, causes and influence. The third concept, which is, was very important in those days, um, was, the quest, was the concept of the neurological trait. 
Now, this is an interesting idea which had developed in the mid-century somewhere at some time, but by 1880, in the time that Gowers wrote, it was universally accepted. Um, it's hardly discussed now until in recent years, until very recently, when um, there seem to be I, uh, modern genetic concepts reinventing uh, this idea. According to this theory, individuals didn't inherit epilepsy alone. They inherited a range of neurological conditions of which epilepsy was only one. Um, this inherited propensity was known as the neurological tray, and it con con contained various conditions, including some psychiatric disorders, sometimes other neurological disorders, some mental retardation, and also, interestingly, some personality disorders. And as Gowers wrote, it is well known that the neuropathic tendency does not always manifest itself in the same form. The chief morbid states beside epilepsy itself, by which the same tendency is manifest, is insanity and to a much smaller degree other chronic forms of disease of the brain and of the spinal cord and intemperance too is probably due in many cases to the same disposition. That's a thought, that's an idea we'll come back to later. Now the fourth uh, concept I want to mention which was of great importance um, and which proved to be completely erroneous uh, but uh, and that is the theory of degeneration. Uh, I'm going to mention it now because of the historical consequences which it had and the lessons from which we might learn from these events. Now, the theory of degeneration uh, was origin originated outside medicine, more in many other types of social discourse, not least in population science. And according to the theory, there was an inherited propensity in some individuals for progressive degeneration, which became more severe as generations moved uh, 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 with each generation. So for instance, and epilepsy was thought by many to be at the core of this, uh, um, this uh, um, tendency. Um, so for instance, one might have uh, migraine in one generation, then in the next generation you might get epilepsy, in the next generation you may get dementia, and so on, and eventually the line would become extinct. Um, according to these theories, um, epilepsy, um, uh, degeneration brought out what were called atavistic traits, which were primitive traits which had disappeared during evolution. Um, and which didn't manifest except in these unfortunate individuals uh, exhibiting these, these traits. They didn't manifest themselves, but they were present in the germline, although not, um, not uh, expressed in most individuals. Um, this, this theory uh, was a social theory too, as I will uh, uh, explain later. Now, um, this theory of inherited degeneration reached its peak at about the end of the 19th century um, with the uh, work of Cesare Lombroso, um, who was not a physician, but a criminologist. And his experimental method was to measure, uh, to look at uh, inherited characteristics, facial characteristics, uh, bodily characteristics um, and also psychological characteristics and he made the uh, extraordinary um, step in considering that criminality in two-thirds of patients was an inherited tray and that criminals weren't made but people were, uh, were didn't people didn't become criminals but they possessed a criminal tray and they were what he called born criminals, and that criminality was one of these atavistic throwbacks to, to previous stages in evolution. Now, this had come at a time when people were looking at populations too, and there was great anxiety in the European populations that with the move of the classes from the rural areas into towns, with people, the lower classes, 
uh, breeding faster than the upper classes, that the population was beginning to be weakened. And um, in Britain, uh, when the Boer War came and Britain, the British Army performed very badly, there was a lot of discussion that this was because of the general weakening of the population. And so Lombroso's ideas um, uh, came on fertile ground. And I mention these because these are examples of these medical ideas getting into social fashion and social fashion in uh, influencing medicine. And then in the fourth edition of his book, Lombroso made the really disastrous link between epilepsy and criminality. And he proposed that epilepsy itself was an, an atavistic characteristic and was a fundamental component of the criminal type. And he supported this by showing pictures of patients, people with epilepsy, and pictures of pa uh, people with criminal, crimin criminal pictures, uh, people from prisons, and um, making various measurements and so on, he found that they shared similar characteristics. And indeed, he wrote that 27% of all epileptics men and 25% of all epileptic women had the full criminal type. Now, this is obviously completely wrong um, and uh, the theory has no basis in, in scientific fact, but it does in my mind illustrate three points which are interesting and valuable today. The first is that medical theories often emerge from the wider social context. Um, as I've said, the theories of degeneration arose because of uh, ideas of degener degeneration in population, and also the arts, the arts in those days were full of uh, pictures of arts and literature, full of pictures of people with degenerative tendencies. And the point was to emphasize that the scientific theories um, mirrored contemporary social theory, and that they were not really objective. And we like to think nowadays of science being objective, but one should recognize that that's not always the case. The second is that although they're clearly wrong and very biased, these theories were universally accepted by doctors and the profession and indeed most scientists. And I think it demonstrates again how skeptical we should be of all scientific theory. And the final point is that the association of epilepsy with this whole business of degeneration became immensely stigmatizing. Um, and this opened the gate for the next scientific uh, development, which was to prove truly disastrous uh, in relation to epilepsy. Um, and this, of course, was the science of eugenics. Now, eugenics became the predominant hereditarian therapy, uh, theory in the first three decades of the last century. Uh, eugenics was the science of improving genetic qualities in a population by selective breeding. Um, it developed from Darwinian theories of natural selection and survival. It was a term coined by Galton, um, who, uh, who advocated positive eugenic solutions. In other words, uh, not negative solutions, which I'll come on to, but positive solutions. And he wasn't interested in medicine. He was much more interested in populations. Now, medical diseases became the subject of eugenic uh, study at, in about 1900. And um, epilepsy, because of its link to degeneration and criminality, was soon the focus and the central feature of many of these studies. And a uh, research office was set up in Woods Hole in the United States with Charles Davenport as director. And in 1911, Davenport uh, produced a seminal paper in which he purported to show uh, uh, that epilepsy was a recessive disorder um, inherited along with imbecility and with um, negative psychiatric uh, features. Um, now, uh, these are his family trees. This was his paper. There's been a lot of studies since shown that, in fact, he simplified a lot of this data and, in fact, may even have fabricated some of his data. And certainly his idea that epilepsy was a recessive disorder is completely wrong. Um, uh, nevertheless, it had uh, enormous consequences because 
Soon after this, uh, the idea arose, the eugenic idea arose, that if you somehow stopped people with epilepsy reproducing, uh, then you might cut down the number of cases by selecting out the genetic um, disorder. Now, of course, the genetics, this is completely wrong from the point of view of uh, modern genetics. That's not how the condition is inherited. But nevertheless, compulsory sterilization started and was soon adopted in 23 states. Um, and I'm interested that Chris quoted Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was the chief justice at the time in the Supreme Court in America, because he had this, he made this statement in this extraordinary case of Bell versus Buck, where Carrie Buck was a lady with a mental retardation and epilepsy. She was forcibly sterilized. Uh, she appealed, and um, Wendell Holmes said it was better for all the world instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or let them starve for their imbecility, society should prevent them, those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind, and he recommended her compulsory sterilization. Um, it turned out in the end that she wasn't even, she wasn't even mentally handicapped, uh, and this, uh, this was a notorious case, but which opened the floodgates for uh, enforced sterilization. Now, of course, this all ended in disaster. Um, with the Nazi periods, eugenics became the justification for the mass murder of the mentally handicapped and the unfit, including those with epilepsy. And it was sanctioned under the guise that this was mercy killing, which would uh, prevent the population from becoming weakened by these people. So what happened was physicians provided the names and the victims were either gassed or poisoned. And it's been estimated that up to 700,000 hopeless cases who were living in institutions uh, were murdered in this way. Now, uh, when all this came to light after the war, the science of genetics in epilepsy basically became out of bounds. And for the next 20 or 30 years, very little activity occurred. Um, this brings us really to the end of this historical period, which was in 1960 with the famous American neurologist William Lennox who was interested in heredity and he made one conspicuous contribution which was the idea, reinventing really the idea that uh, genetics interacted with other factors to create epilepsy and he had this very colorful um, kind of a concept of a streams running into a river, the river being the patient with epilepsy, the streams being the various influences which lead to the condition. So some of them were genetic, some were acquired, some were environmental, and some were hereditary. And then um, the stream runs into a reservoir, and the height of the banks of the reservoir determine whether or not the person has, epile uh, has a seizure and the banks uh, being set largely by genetics, but also by environmental causes. And this was a very colorful uh, way of expressing what was really known about the heredity of epilepsy in about uh, 1960. Now this brings us then to the next phase, which is the era of molecular genetics. Um, <clears throat> and, um, uh, there's a picture here of the human chromosomes, um, 46 of them. In fact, this number was only really fully understood to be the number in 1956. It seems an extraordinarily short time ago. And in 1953, the amazing discoveries of how genetics operated were made uh, by Watson and Crick. Um, they discovered that Although it was known that heredity somehow heredited, uh, hered inherited characteristics were somehow passed by the nucleus of a cell and probably by DNA, it wasn't realized how the whole thing was coded. And Watson and Crick devised them the model of the double helix, uh, which I guess uh, everybody here has heard about, in which there are chains of nucleotide bases, four types of bases, which code for proteins and these chains, three of these bases, little uh, form a codon, uh, 
there are four different types of bases. So you can have many combinations, 20 or more combinations. They code for an amino acid. The uh, RNA copies from the DNA, which is then transfers the codon into an amino acid. Um, and an ami a protein is built up from a collection of amino acids. So the string of DNA and, and base code codes are translated into strings of amino acids, um, <clears throat> which form the protein. And um, variations in the genetic code end up as variations in protein. And these variations sometimes cause disease. And so what you're inheriting here from this code, transferred into the protein, transferred into the body, causes the disease. Now, after this discovery was made, uh, there was really uh, rapid progress. Um, by 1972, the first whole genome, the whole genetic code of an organism was published. Um, and then uh, the invention of DNA sequencing by Sanger was invented. In other words, a method for identifying the code. Then it was realized that there were some genes, also things called regulator genes. And by the 1970s, it was realized that they were getting close to the whole human genome. And in 2000, the first whole genome, the first whole code of a human person was published. We recognized a little bit earlier that the human and the chimpanzee differed by only 1%. And in fact, the human differs from the earthworm, really. Uh, they share 75% of genes. And one of the enormous surprises of the Genome Project, really, was how few genes there are. And there are only 20 to 20,000, 25,000 in the human, human genome. And so the whole genetic basis with all the variation of hum human and indeed the animal kingdom is based on these genes. And very soon we'll have the um, human genome for $1,000 and all of us can get our genome uh, uh, identified and published. So where does epilepsy fit into all this? Sorry, I'm... you move the maybe the thank you okay well uh, in these 50 years there have been um, a number of major advances and I think in the field of epilepsy, I've listed these here. First, um, all the Mendelian disorders, the genetic disorders, the single gene disorders, in which epilepsy is part of the phenotype, part of the overall clinical picture, pretty well all of them have now been identified. There are over 200, um, and uh, they've all been discovered by what are called family linkage studies where you have a family with lots, of, with lots of members with these conditions, and you compare the genome of the members with the condition, with the genome of members without the condition, basically, and you can identify the genetic defect. Now, out of these uh, 200 or so cases, uh, 200 and so conditions, 13 genes were found where the persons only had epilepsy, but they didn't have any other features. And these have been called the pure epilepsies. And the first one was discovered in Melbourne in 1994. And since then, there have been 13 genes identified, which defects of which cause pure epilepsy without all the other features of mental retardation or other conditions. And as I say, all of them have been discovered by family linkage studies. Um, these are the 13 genes. Um, these are the epilepsy conditions which pr they produce. Um, and uh, the key, there are two key points. The first is that these conditions are generally quite rare. And these 13 genes account for a very small number of the overall population of epilepsy. 
One in 200 people in the population have epilepsy. About 1% of those 1 in 200 have one of the has defects in one of these genes. And the second interesting feature is the same gene can produce different types of epilepsy syndromes. And that immediately tells you that it's not just a simple transcription. There must be some other complicated feature. Um, the second uh, fact for these are that all these genes turn out to be what are called uh, iron channel genes. They're genes which code for a protein in the membrane of neurons. And this was an enormous shock. And for the first time, it was then postulated that epilepsy might be what's called a channelopathy, a disease of iron channels. Um, in the meantime, enormous progress was made in the molecular basis of the, of the um, uh, membranes. Uh, and indeed, these channels, which are uh, units which are put into the membranes, the long neuron, neuronal membranes, and which allow the passage of ions in and out of the cell. And it's the passage of these ions which changes the electrical characteristic of the cell, which allows a nerve discharge to pass along the axon. Uh, these, these have now been uh, identified in 3D by crystallography. Um, and the whole genetic basis of each of these channel genes, the whole gen genome structure has been identified. Um, and defects are shown in this picture where uh, little defects in various parts of these genes result in a change in the structure of the protein, which results in a deficiency in the passage of the iron either too much or too little. And it's that changes the electri electrical characteristic of the cell. And it's the change in electrical characteristic cell which causes hyperexcitability, as Jackson put it, um, and which makes the cell fire off in an epileptic fashion. So here's an example where the genetics has led to an understanding of the mechanism, uh, which has led to a plausible explanation of why a seizure occurs. Um, and you can look at the uh, electrical patterns of cells with defects in these genes compared with cells which are normal. And you can see their electrical pattern differs. And the way that spontaneous firing occurs in those cells uh, also differs on the basis of these channel genes. So this was an extraordinary development. It showed that epilepsy, there were 13 genes which were found which underlay some forms of epilepsy. These were all channel genes. This affected the electrical uh, nature of the membrane. And that, you can see how that electrical disturbance immediately could translate into an epileptic seizure. And so this was a phenomenal development. Um, having done this, uh, people started looking at the common epilepsies, not the ones running in families where you could do a linkage study, but they just looked at random patients with epilepsy and carried out what are called case, uh, uh, case control association studies. Um, and this is one of the great disappointments of modern genetics in epilepsy, that these case control association studies have led absolutely nowhere. Um, and this was a study again from Australia showing that 165 have been carried out, 100, $100 billion spent on these, and we have zero results. Um, I think what it does show is that epilepsy is a complicated affair, and that except in these families, which are very exceptional, in the ordinary person with epilepsy, uh, although there may, may, be, may well be a genetic basis, it's not the result of a single gene mutation. And as Steve Jones, who's a very famous biologist in London, wrote in the British Medical Journal, the mountain has labored and brought forth a mouse. And it's very difficult to disagree with this, which is one of the major disappointments of uh, genetics in recent years. Now, um, so what about the future? That's pretty well where we are now. And um, I'm going to end this lecture by considering a couple of examples of the complexity which exists in the genetics of epilepsy, um, uh, which may help explain the paradox. Although everybody agrees epilepsy must have a genetic basis, 
the genetic form of this basis is completely is largely still completely undiscovered. Now, uh, there's a couple of clues, and this is some interesting recent work, um, which has not looked at defects in individual genes, but has looked at what are called copy number variants, which are the presence in the genetic code of duplications of genes, or sometimes deletions of bits of genes, or even whole genes. Um, and these duplications or deletions, which sometimes occur as a thing is being copied, like anybody who's ever done any massive photocopying will know that you occasionally make mistakes. Well, so does the copying of DNA. And um, sometimes you miss a bit or sometimes you duplicate a bit. Um, and uh, people have been looking at the presence of copy number variations in epilepsy, and they've been finding that some patients with epilepsy have these uh, copy number variations. That's uh, discovery number one. But the second most intriguing finding, really, is that it is the same copy number variants that underpin epilepsy as also underpin some of the neuropsychiatric disorders which had been in parallel studied. So, for instance, the first one found was a deletion there, which is also found in patients with schizophrenia. Um, then uh, a large study was carried out finding deletions and, and duplications in f at five sites on the genome. Um, and these, some of these sites are shared with patients who also have autism, different patients who suffer from autism. <clears throat> and um, this uh, really, to me, seems to be a reinvention of the idea that epilepsy is inherited by mechanisms by which other neurological diseases are also inherited, including some of the neuropsychiatric disorders, which is, of course, exactly what Gowers and co. were saying in the middle of the 19th century. Now, we've been, for some years, looking at what's called comorbidity, in which, uh, the, uh, which is the fact that people with epilepsy tend to have more depression and sometimes other problems uh, associated with the epilepsy. And it has been up till now generally assumed that comorbidity was caused by having epilepsy. But now it looks as if it's possible that these uh, associations are not causal at all, uh, but they reflect the fact that both may have the same mechanism. <clears throat> and in fact, people have now been looking at whether comorbidities predate the epilepsy and therefore can't be due to the epilepsy. And in fact, it's been found that the uh, instance of depression, for instance, and psychosis in patients who subsequently develop epilepsy is a lot higher than it would be in a controlled population also. And so the so-called bidirectionality of comorbidity may be something to do with the shared genetic basis. At least that seems to be a hypothesis which would be well worth following up. Um, also found was using these studies of uh, copy number variations. People have found that the expression of a gene um, which is affected by, say, a deletion, the, the expression of that gene is, not, is affected, but also a whole lot of other genes around it also seem to be affected. Um, and, it's, and there are now beginning to be recognized various ways in which this may occur. And um, this finding of copy number variation also reveals the potential for what might be called reverse phenotyping, where instead of looking at a person with epilepsy and trying to find the genetic basis, you look at copy number variations and try and find out uh, what uh, disease is inherited together. And that, of course, is what they were doing, as I said, in the 19th century. Now, this idea that uh, there may be functional networks of genes affected by defects in one gene um, has been further explored, um, <coughs> um, particularly by a computational um, uh, method called functional annotation analysis, whereby uh, groups of genes which are associated with certain, uh, which all influence certain biological um, uh, processes are looked at together. And people have looked at whether the genes affected in epilepsy 
um, can fall into these groups. And it's been found that some of the networks affected in epilepsy, for instance, are those to do with synaptic transmission or synaptic vesicles, but not, for instance, those to do with neuronal proliferation or neuronal motility. So it looks as if now that these genes affected in epilepsy may fall into certain patterns of neurological process shared sometimes with other neuropsychiatric diseases uh, and this makes um, and that effects on one gene can have an effect uh, down the line on other genes in the same network. And this is why we can't find them in simple association studies, which are looking simply at finding one defect in one uh, gene. And the final point, another area of modern investigation, is the question of epilepsy as a developmental disorder. <clears throat> um, and uh, there's a very nice kind of visual model uh, uh, presented here by uh, Waddington some years ago. The issue here is that genes may interact with, with each other, the so-called epistatic interactions. They may interact with other factors which are non-genetic, environmental factors. Heat is one for instance, and the heating uh, heat or temperature affects the expression of all sorts of different genes. Um, and the, uh, the final and the other point is time. And Waddington uh, envisaged a ball rolling down a kind of hill, a landscape, where the landscape is um, basically um, uh, the, sh the, the slope of the hills is basically defined by your genetic makeup. And so a ball will usually fall down that landscape. And this genetic makeup, the phenotype might be epilepsy, this one might be normal, that one might be schizophrenia. And the point he makes is that although the genetic makeup largely accounts for the way the ball rolls down the hill, uh, when there are changes in the environment, wind or something or heat or even chance, particularly at certain points in time, which he called choice points. So when the ball gets here, it can either go down there or it can go down there. And even a minor perturbation will throw it in this direction. Um, and he devised this model to show that as an organism develops, as different genes are expressed and different genes are no longer expressed, different and the, and the, the reason is that the in the influence of each individual gene in this complex developmental pathway might be very slight. And there is this model called the polygenic mutation selection balance, where mutations are selected out at a certain rate of the population. Uh, but that selection, because the genetic influence is quite weak, is quite slow and is balanced by the equal uh, um, input of new mutations. And it may be this balance between new mutations and uh, selection pressures uh, not, uh, which creates the persistence of a disease like epilepsy. I think the point I'm trying to raise in mentioning these points is that this is a highly complex situation. And the very simplistic view we've taken of genetics to date, I don't think uh, can, is, is perhaps not surprising that in epilepsy we've got only a very limited uh, way down the path. And the final uh, point is the question again of the social implications. And I'm going to end on this general point. Now in the early 20th century, contemporary med medical genetics uh, was adopted into the field of social policy uh, in the eugenics movement, and that had disastrous results. And eugenics used what, what have shown to be pseudoscientific evidence for dividing people basically into normal and into abnormal classes. Now, eugenic theory was flawed, but it was a justification for the massacre of hundreds of thousands of people. And the very power of modern genetics must be even more powerful than the previous genetics. And people with epilepsy, I think, are still very vulnerable. Uh, 
particularly if the flavor of research moves into considering epilepsy to be in somehow related, which it seems to be, with other neuropsychiatric disorders. And I think we must be exceptionally vigilant in this area to ensure that we don't use our scientific discovery for malevolent or immoral ends. And our science has a responsibility and can never be morally neutral. And that is particularly true of genetics. And I, th I think this is a message which I'm sure that Mr. Thierry Srinivasan would have known and completely understood. Thank you very much. As is customary, there will be a short question and answer session. So please direct your questions to Professor Shorwan. No questions by the Hammersmith. Yes, please. I just wanted to ask a question on the, from the clinical perspective. You know, we are on the 10th anniversary of the human genome decoding. And a lot of people have been analyzing is what has happened and what's the implication of the human genome de deciphering on medicine in general, including by Francis Collins of NIH and Craig Venter, two of the leaders in the field. Now, what they predict is the whole approach to medicine is going to change in the coming years, particularly with respect to movement towards personalized medicine, understanding populations of uh, diseases as well as patients, and modify treatments according to the specific needs of individuals. To what extent is this applicable to epilepsy? Um, I, I, uh, that's uh, obviously a very uh, important question. I think the main impact to date of genetics has been, is this working on? Has been in the field, for instance, of cancer I think the main implications of genetics to date have been in the field of cancer and, say, immunology. And uh, um, it does seem to be that in these fields, single gene defects can have a major effect. Um, epilepsy being a developmental disorder or a degenerative disorder, possibly, um, is more complex, and it does seem that in the neurology disorders anyway, it's not only epilepsy, other neurological conditions, the impact has been less. Um, and I think that may reflect the nature of the uh, abnormality, which in cancer may be a, sim a single breakpoint in a single gene. But that's definitely not the case in neurology, um, in most, anyway, neurological conditions. And as for the question of personalized medicine, um, a lot has been said. I remember going to a meeting about 10 years ago in London where the head of Glaxo came along and said, we must all give him all our patients DNA and within a few years there will be personalized treatment of epilepsy. Well, it has simply not happened. And if you ask me the reason it's not happened is that there are so many factors which influence response to treatment which have absolutely nothing to do with the gen genetics of uh, an individual, um, that it would be, in a way, foolish to expect it to have any difference. So, for instance, in epilepsy, the type of epilepsy, the severity, if you've got a lesion, the position in the brain of the lesion, the size of the lesion, if you've got a drug, the dose of the drug, um, all of these influence we all know people have seizures when they have too much alcohol, too little sleep. None of this is genetic. It may have genetic, some sort of genetic implication, but it's very unlikely to be a single genetic factor. And because of that, I, my personal view is that uh, and I, I live to be proved completely wrong, but I suspect that we're never going to identify strong genetic influences which affect response to treatment. You raised one particular issue which is uh, of concern to society and has some serious consequences of the way insurance is given. And your mention of 
creating disabled minorities. And as you link cancer or some other diseases, maybe cardiac, diabetes, as is known, uh, will, can have, what kind of, how does the uh, governments view <laughs> DNA studies and yeah. the way insurance or care is then becomes available to the average citizen? It's an extremely complicated situation. Um, I suppose a lot comes down to the reason for people looking into this in government or anything else. I mean, if it is a bene beneficent reason, I mean, if you want to I don't, I try to identify the, the cancer genes so that you can develop therapy for that genetic defect, that's obviously fine. If, on the other hand, you want to identify cancer genes so that you exclude these people from the breeding population or something, which is exactly what happened in eugenics, then uh, that is a great mistake. It was a great mistake in eugenics because it was based on completely erroneous ideas on how genetic um, um, influences were in fact inherited. They're not inherited simply down a single line. It's much more complicated than that. It's interactions, it's groups of genes, it's genes plus environment. So I think for certain diseases, there may be reasons for governments and authorities to have information. But for other situations, I would suggest that um, science try to put a ring around the usage of this information. Yes. Um, uh, during the course of your speech, uh, you had pointed out that a nervous uh, disorder was due to distorted nutrition. And then you went on to say that distorted nutrition was due to vascular conditions. So it clearly hammers a point that everything is due to heredity factor. Two. The point number two yeah. is, then you went on to explain that heredity is one of the cause and the acquired sy syndromes, that is your work environment, could cause neurological disorders. But then when you say about this uh, entire thing is due to your acquired heredity, so the acquired factors does not take, find a place at all because we can definitely come to the conclusion that everything is due to heredity. I, no, and sorry. for that, a small question. And another point number two is, you said 20,000 to 25,000 genes in human DA, DNA. I would just like to uh, find out from you whether any gene therapy treatment is in the offing for curing epilepsy or other neurological disorders. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first point about the, what, uh, the, uh, it wasn't me who suggested, this was Hewling Jackson 100 years ago, who said, 150 years ago, who said that there were common mechanisms at the end of causing diseases. It didn't matter what influences were coming in, some were environment, some were genetics, head injury, heat, stress, always there was still the common mechanism, and that was due to a nutritional defect. Of course, he didn't know what any idea of chemistry or anything, but uh, in fact, I don't think people now call it nutritional, but they do call it bio uh, neurochemical. And if you transplant the word neurochemistry for nutrition in Jackson's word you work, you could almost be looking at something today. And I think the idea that there are a few common pathways probably is correct. Um, now, the question of gene therapy, um, if there is a single gene and it explains the whole disease, and that is the situation, say, in some muscle diseases, one or two rare muscle diseases, then somehow putting back that gene might somehow create the um, the normal protein instead of the abnormal protein, and then the the, the um, uh, organ, the muscle, might begin to work properly. That's the theory. Um, and indeed, in muscle disease, there have been one or two attempts at this. In the more complex central nervous system diseases, I think we are miles away from any genetic therapy, I must say. Um, uh, again, I look forward to being proved wrong, but I can't personally see there being the slightest chance of a gene therapy in the next in my lifetime anyway, for any of the brain disorders. Yes, Dr. Armstrong. 
um, criminals and uh, epileptics shared same physiognomic features. I think very great names in history, in Greek history and perhaps Julius Caesar and Napoleon, they all seem to have had um, seizures, <laughs> but these sort of criminals so by any criminals. chance are uh, between criminality and uh, becoming the great warriors, is there a yeah. link? Yeah. That is I've number one. <laughs> the other one is comorbidities may predate epilepsy. That means does schizophrenia or something is a precursor to epilepsy. Number three is, these are days of cell phones and they are talking about uh, disorders in the brain due to constant use of telephones. By any chance, does epilepsy also have some um, association with it? With cell phones, I suppose. Depends, I suppose, what the message is you'll get receiving. Um, but I, I think the, this thing with criminality is obviously wrong. It was just Lombroso's idea. Um, I don't think we should accept it. I mean, it's based on a whole lot of spurious statistics. But it rang a bell in the social milieu in which it was proposed. Um, the, whether Julius Caesar had epilepsy, epilepsy of criminals, therefore Julius Caesar must have been a criminal. Uh, whether that is, that is scientifically proven, I think is very doubtful. <laughs> um, I don't think epilepsy has any, there's any indication that it is due to cell phones, I must say. I hope not, otherwise <laughs> I'm surprised I haven't had a seizure standing on this podium. Hello. Can I ask you? I would like to know if epilepsy is, can be completely cured or will it be a continuous process of treatment on the patients or R&D by the doctors continuously for years together? Um, can it be cured? Fun, funnily enough, this was a question we were discussing in the conclave which preceded this talk. Uh, only this morning. Um, I think the general view is that many patients with epilepsy grow out of having the condition. So although it's not cured, it does go away. Uh, and then there's another group of patients where the drugs taken or the treatments um, suppress the condition. They don't really cure the, the tendency to have a seizure but while you're taking the drugs, they stop that tendency manifesting. So in that sense, they are cured in the sense they don't, it doesn't occur anymore, but it's not cured in the sense that the underlying propensity has, has gone away. I don't know if that answers your question. If the drugs are stopped or tapered down, will it have increased? Um, epileptic fits? If it hasn't disappeared over time, if you haven't grown out, the person hasn't grown out of it, then, and you stop the drugs, and the drugs are being effective, then the, the seizures may recur, yes. And that not infrequently happens. So you'll have to have a continuous, if the epilepsy doesn't stop, even after continuous men, usage men, of drugs for more than 10 years, we might have to continue for years together? Many people do, yeah. Thank you. I am Dr. Dandra. I just want to know what is the impact of this genetics abnormality in choosing the anti-epileptic drugs? I am sure you will have so many different channels or something abnormal. Yeah. Is there any specific drug which should be chosen? Yeah, um, Second thing is, one minute sir. Sorry. Second thing is the duration of AED therapy in those with these uh, uh, specific uh, genetic defects. That also. Third thing is, which are the patients whom you like to do the genetic studies? Does it do, you may have to choose, some guidelines will be there, I think. Uh, so. Okay. Um, does genetic 
the knowledge of genetics influence treatment is the first question. And um, I, th I think the basic answer at the moment is not, not really. Although there are certain types of genetic epilepsy, the so-called idiopathic generalized epilepsies, it's a subtype of epilepsy which has a strong genetic tendency. Although I may say we don't know what the genetics, that we don't know which genes cause it on the whole. Um, that type of epilepsy responds to certain types of drugs. But you don't need to know the genetics, you just need to know the syndrome. You need to know the pattern of uh, that type of patient. You need to know what the epilepsy looks like. You know that it has a genetic basis, you know that it responds to certain drugs, but the knowledge of the genetics doesn't allow you to choose the drug. Um, whether having genetic epilepsy makes you more likely or less likely to have to have drugs for ever or for long periods of time, again, is not really known. Although many of these genetic conditions change over time as the person develops. And so the idiopathic generalized epilepsies, for instance, often get a lot better over as the person gets into adult life or into late adult life. And in those people, uh, the, the need for treatment may well stop. Um, I'm afraid I can't remember the, the third question. There are two new slogans in the United States for neurologists. One is, please listen to the patient, he's trying to tell you the diagnosis. The second is, Hurry, hurry, use the new drug before it stops curing you. Now, these applies to epilepsy because there is the famous connotation in epilepsy. Is it a fit? Is it a faint? Or is it a funny turn? A funny turn is a British uh, a proverb which probably today refers to transient global amnesia. That is, you lose your memory for a short period. So, for a young doctor, I think the most important thing is to make sure the person has got epilepsy and not label him as an epileptic. So that's where I think talking to the relatives, the witness, observer and so on becomes important. The other thing which I wanted to tell Professor Shaw, one is there's a high degree of cons consanguinity in, the, in all over the country, especially in the south and uh, we don't know quite what the impact is, whether you have studied it. I don't think there are any comprehensive studies. For instance, a girl would marry her own maternal uncle. It's very common here. The, these are social issues that came up in the last century because of the advantages it provided for the marriage. Uh, whether you have any studies to show that that kind of consanguineous marriage, there is more incident, greater incidence? Uh, um, I'm not is there any study that has been performed? Has been yes. There is? Yes. yes. Good. And does it show increase no. of no? <laughs> right. Well, it's my pleasant duty to propose a vote of thanks. I want you all to give a standing ovation to the Srinivasan family. But for their generosity, thoughtfulness and their help, I don't think any of this would be possible. And they've never asked anything in return. This is very, very important. Uh, Secondly, I want you to give a, a grand ovation to Professor Simon Shorwan. Thank you, Simon, for coming all the way and giving the oration. And my son and I share the Queen Square tie. And finally, I want to talk, or thank all the audience and the TVS uh, group, Mr. starting with Mr. Lakshmanan, Bala, and all the doctors, Rai and Rajan Babu, and all these people who have helped us to conduct this function. Thank you very much. Please stay back. Tea is served. Please stay, go and have your cup of tea. Thank you.